Welcome to The Grizzly Beat, a podcast of Grizzly Times and Louisa Wilcox, where we interview scientific experts, managers, Native Americans, writers, and others to share their knowledge, perspectives, and experience. This comes at a time of enormous interest in the grizzly bear's future as the government proposes to remove federal protections and citizens are asking important questions. We hope the information shared here will help listeners shape their own answers. Well, this is Louisa Wilcox with the Grizzly Beat, and we're here today with Rick Bass, who is a world-renowned writer and conservation advocate, and he lives here in Montana. But he was born in Fort Worth, Texas, and he studied petroleum geology at Utah State University, and he started to write short stories on his lunch breaks when he was working as a petroleum geologist in Mississippi. And then in 1987, he moved with his wife to the remote Yak Valley, where he works to protect his adopted home from roads, logging, and now out-of-control recreationists. Uh, Rick has written countless magazine articles and essays and stories and over 30 fiction and nonfiction books, including his not-to-be-missed most recent collection of short stories for a little while. His list of writing awards are as long as your arm, and I have to give you a personal warning. You just can't read his work without falling in love with wilderness, grizzly bears, wolves all over again. And if you haven't yet engaged in advocacy to save our small planet, you may find yourself plunging in. Thanks, Rick, for being here. Oh, thank you, Louise. It's a great honor, and, and uh, thanks, thanks for the program and all that you do for uh, you know, bears and everything else wild. Well, we, we all try. Yeah. So, Rick, you, you've been an enormous fan of grizzly bears in wilderness and have been one of its most eloquent spokesmen for decades now. Maybe you can share an experience with a bear that you found particularly powerful. Mm. Um, yeah, there are. I mean, there are all. Anytime you're fortunate enough to see to see a bear, uh, any kind of bear, grizzly or black, any kind of bear, it's you know it changes your day, changes your week, it recalibrates how you think about yourself. You know, you're, it's like seeing a gorilla. You're just st- struck by the the sentience and uh, 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 intelligence of the animal. It, it, it recalibrates uh, this myth, this perception we have that we're because our our brains are pretty big. We're uh, you know we've got everything figured out. Uh, they, they've been here a lot longer, and they have a lot. We have a lot in similar with them, uh, and uh, and you're reminded of how much uh, alike we are, like them. Uh, when you see them, and and again, you're you're humbled. You're you're reminded that they they they're a lot closer to having it figured out than we are. They've been here a lot longer and uh, inhabit the world with you know greater, uh, I guess what we call sophistication, greater greater elegance of fit. Um, uh, it's pretty pretty amazing. Just you know, get a glimpse of them. Uh, uh, you know, all the old cliches are true. You're 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 reminded. Uh, uh, of how we're not the most, uh, not only we necessarily, there are different ways to measure intelligence, but you're also reminded, uh, wow, we're really puny and, and frail and uh, lucky to be here. I had, a, uh, you know, one of those wonderful uh, adrenalizing uh, encounters just this summer with a, a big female with a, a very large subadult. In fact, I saw her subadult and thought it was a, a mature bear and uh and then I saw her stand up behind it, and she came running down the trail, or not the trail, over the ridge at me. I was on the trail and uh, had never had that experience in the yak. The, the grizzlies I've been fortunate to see uh, up here have always just run like uh, greyhounds away from me if they saw me or scented me or heard me. And uh, mm-hmm. this one, everything, the setup was just all wrong, which is what happens eventually if you spend enough time in the woods. You're going to, there's just going to be a, a, a bad setup. And uh she it was a bluff charge and and uh, but I, I didn't know that and was fortunate to have bear spray with me uh which i just can't recommend enough to uh mm-hmm. carry it with you and she she turned away you know at 10 15 feet just like they wow. almost always do and uh it was weird her uh her sub adult ran south and uh you know up and over the, the same hill that she'd come over just just took out of there but she came back a second time that was really uh-huh. interesting um you know yeah. with a little less uh fervor but then she went went behind me like she's trying to cut off my back trail so she it was it was uh it was it was 
it was exciting. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and you prepare for it. You, you know, you practice uh, right. situations thinking, you know, when you're talking to the bears, even if you don't know they're not there or not, when you realize you're in a place where they could be or should be. And uh, so it wasn't a surprise, and I knew what to do from, you know, all the all the thinking about it. But, uh, yeah, it, it definitely stays with you uh, uh, a good long while. And, uh, you know, you're, my overwhelming uh, reaction was, uh, you know, apology or regret that I had stressed her out like that. I mean, there wasn't anything I could have done, but, um, you know, right. it was just the two of us in one space, and she uh, she just said her piece and then left, which I thought was really, uh, uh, I'm grateful for that. Uh, you know, up, you, you'll see, uh, this time of year, you'll see hunters, you know, elk hunters, bow hunters, and, and even uh, rifle hunters with uh, the, these damn, uh, you know, hog leg pistol arrows on their on their shoulder harnesses and you know and stuff it's just it's just it's it's just heartbreaking it's generally the, the folks who carry the compound bows also rather than traditional bow hunters but even even those you just see people you people you see people going on hikes with their kids you know huckleberry picking with a with a bucket of you know <clears throat> with uh you know these these six shooters on their hips and stuff just flapping around it's like uh you know, if it's that dangerous, if you really feel that way about it, don't you? You know, why would you be taking your your children into a war zone where you feel you need to shoot your way out of it with a you know with right. a well, you know with a this huge caliber pistol that's going to uh, you know enrage the bear? Probably won't kill it with one shot. Uh, you might miss it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You might shoot yourself. You might shoot whoever you're with. It's just a it's. It's something we don't talk about enough. Is is uh, you know enough with the pistols, folks? Just just get a tube of bear spray, uh, know where it is on your hip, and, and walk. It's a lot lighter, a lot quieter, a lot safer, a lot cheaper. Uh, you know, you don't go to the woods with a pistol unless you aim to kill something. I mean, that the default when, when you put that pistol on, you're not thinking I'm going to protect myself. You're thinking I'm going to kill something if it if I see it or if I if it comes at me and. Um, you know, I, I just don't think people have thought this through about what a an awful amount of uh, legal hassle and, and ecological, uh, you know, upset that is uh, for an endangered species. It's, uh, but it's kind of a, an un, I just don't think people have thought about it enough. Right. So all that to say, I'm really here to uh, testify to bear spray and, and say just <laughs> get a tube and take it with you and, and everything will be fine. Thank you. Um, so, Rick, you've written and spoken so much about the mystery of wolves and bears, and and also about what you were just mentioning about how some people just don't seem to get it, and uh, airily gun down wolves and and just unnecessarily um, end up killing stuff. Yeah. Why, why do you think that is? Why don't? Why do you think some people just don't get it? You know, uh, well, it, it, it's it's I think it's a pretty easy answer. It's how you know white folks. Uh, it just became part of the cultural template from, uh, you know, from the, the day we first crossed the, the Mississippi. Uh, you know, our, all of our <clears throat> journals and narratives are about, uh, you know, seeing animals of force or indeed people of force and moving them out. Uh, uh, and there was, there were just no stories, no culture, no pathways of, of not killing bears or not killing wolves uh, and you know it's it's true enough uh, they were hell on stock uh, you know and that was that was kind of our middle name back then was was uh, cattle and sheep but that's not our middle name now and uh, right. you know we are making adjustments uh, you know with those I, w- I want to say hobbies there it's not a hobby for some folks but but it's increasingly uh or, or de- decreasingly a, um, a life way, but but regardless, we just don't have a, you know enough bears and wolves to be perpetuating that that saga of shooting the grizzly in the corral, of shooting the wolf at the edge of the pasture. Uh, you know there are other avenues, other ways to protect your sheep and cattle and horses, and uh, but we have we're, you know I say that we're starting to we're starting to figure that out. I mean we've invested forty years of uh, you know, relationship reaccommodation with with grizzlies and, and uh, uh, you know through the Endangered Species Act, and we've got a you know generation or two of people who are starting to figure out. Okay, uh, your first inclination upon seeing a bear is not to shoot it and kill it, but to be 
thrilled that you had the good fortune to see it. And, you know, it, it, takes, it takes a long time. It takes several generations for culture to get deeply set, and especially when you're erasing an old culture and then resetting a new one. It can take, you know, 50 or 100 years. So we're getting closer, which, of course, makes the, the proposed Yellowstone delisting all the more whack. Like, uh, I mean, how schizophrenic is that to uh, spend 40 years cultivating a relationship between bears and humans where the bears run away or learn to coexist in valley bottoms and avoid dog food and avoid bird feeder seed and, and uh, tiptoe around at night and not get in trouble and people don't get in trouble. And, you know, we're, we're having a shot at changing the relationship. And, and, and now just to flip it overnight, uh, you know, what are the bears going to make of that? It's going gonna, it's gonna to set back the uh, relationship between humans and bears uh, irreparably for us to all of a sudden say, oh, no, oh, you know, we changed our mind. We were protecting you for 40 years, but now we're going to start killing you again. Uh, sorry, we were mistaken. Fooled you. You know, it's just, it's just, it's so, uh, so abrupt, so human, so uh, polarized, so, so schizophrenic. You know, it's uh, classic well, human behavior. Have... First we're one way, then we're another. You talk about bears being unpredictable. You know, the only thing unpredictable in this equation is humans. Right, right. And Yellowstone is only the beginning. I mean, the government is proposing uh, maybe yeah. by the end of this year to strip federal protections for Yellowstone bears, but then come glacier bears. Yeah, um, no, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a, an unsophisticated, really brutal, primitive political play. Where if they think they're being tricky, you know, it's not chess. It's just checkers, and, and we've known it was, that was their goal. They've, they've, they've actually been pretty frank about it all along, saying, well, we, you know, we want to delist the grizzly everywhere as fast as we can. And that's discussions that they have in rural communities, setting up rural communities for, uh, you know, un expectations that cannot be met and, and should not be met, uh, you know, with the, with the speed uh, with which these discussions are, and expectations are being, being promoted. Uh, you know, well, let's combine the cabinet and the yak. Well, let's combine the cabinet and the yak and the Silkirk population. Ah, let's combine the Silkirk, the cabinet, the yak, and the glacier population. In fact, mm -hmm. you know what, let's just call it, let's just say, we've, there, there are a lot of grizzly bears in Alaska. Let's just say they're recovered. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 um, it's humiliating to, uh, to be, you know, you know uh, to have your government uh, masquerading as, as scientists uh, with these, these discussions where they already know the answer they want, and they're just doing... You know, this really basic kindergarten primary math, one plus one plus one, trying to get to the answer that they want. And uh, it's, you know, and if you have any kind of scientific training, it's even more uh, outrage, outrageous to, uh, mm -hmm. to see what they're presenting as science. And uh, it's, just, it's just brute politics, you know. Surprise. <laughs> right. But brute politics for what, Rick? I mean, what do you think undergirds all this? I think... Uh, uh, it, it's it's not that complicated, but it's uh, you know as Doug or dear friend Doug Peacock would say, I think chicken shit underlies it all. I mean, I think <laughs> government is afraid of of the uh, the raucous uh, self pitying whining uh, voice of the uh, so called libertarian West. You know, the one percent of, of backwoods hermits who claim that government is meddling too much in in their lives when when actually the West, it, you know, is the most subsidized region in, in, in America. Uh, you know, we would not exist out here without the, the roads and the schools and the, and the county payments and, and everything else that, uh, that makes this place habitable for white folks in, in puffy down vest uh, 12, 12 months a year. Uh, at, at any rate, I think it's, it's a real lack of resolve and, and spine uh, you know, by surprise, uh, politicians who don't get elected and reelected by sticking their head out and neck out and doing, doing the right thing. Uh, I think they're so easily cowed by a few uh, vehement voices of dissent and, and not much influenced by science, unfortunately. And we don't really have a tradition of politicians um, uh, uh, listening to science. But I think politicians are intimidated by science because they perceive it to be difficult and uh, mm -hmm. Uh, it's uh, you know it's uh, it's up to activists such as ourselves to uh, to speak louder and longer and 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 also more factually and truthfully than than the uh, inflammatory opposition. It's it's just kind of hand to hand combat with uh, a few old dying blowhards, uh, and yeah. it, it would be all the worse shame to see 
you know, in their dying last generational gasp to get the better of Yellowstone grizzlies and Montana grizzlies, which have been through so much for so long and are still hanging on. You know, we've lost the last grizzly in California. We've lost the last grizzly in Colorado and Utah. You know, mm-hmm. state by state, they blink out, and uh, that's what makes Montana most special and, and better than the other western states is our uh, big country and the grizzlies we still have left in it. And to open up a sport hunting uh, international season on them, just uh, not only is it devastating to the bears whose demographics we still don't know, you know, how many old bears, how many females, how many young, how many sub-adults, what are their relationships, what's their connection across populations. Despite not knowing what we need to know about those things, uh, it would just change the relationship. It would become um, a place where bears were frightened, which, you know, is consistently nonstop frightened. And that's not the identity of a grizzly bear. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that does not, ironically, paradoxically, that does not serve us best to have bears frightened all the time. Uh, they need to respect people, but they also need to learn how to coexist, not not view us as the enemy and and uh, and vice versa. Yeah, well, Rick, you have written a lot on the states and the role of the states and uh, even problems of state wildlife management, um, particularly in your Nine Mile Wolf book. And obviously after delisting, management of bears would return to the states. Maybe you can share some of your views and concerns about state management. Yeah, yeah, sure. And it's again, it's not really rocket science, but but any kind of cycle of, of deep experience with the, these these issues is going to point out what you know. What I think is pretty obvious is the uh, the volatility of state politics uh, does not uh, bode well for long term consistency that's required for a recovery of an endangered species. I, I don't think the states. Uh, even you know, even the good states are set up to recover threatened and endangered sensitive species. There, there's too much of a profit motive if it's something that's huntable. You know, again, you know why we think that if a bear goes off an endangered species list, we have to go out and hunt it. I, again, that's that's maddening to me. I mean, like, why is that our default response when something is recovered? Like the Coeur d'Alene salamander or the sensitive long-toed salamander. You know, if we ever get the, that off the list, we're going to go out and have a gigging, gigging season for them. That's just <laughs> that's what's been you know wired into us is this this short-term extractive take 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 uh, mentality. But at any rate, the states have with their their short cycles and and especially the western states with the uh, the uh, Volatility of, of party politics uh, that would that would amplify the, the already existing schizophrenic uh, 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 impulse of government, and uh, and it's just all the more. And then that's further amplified when you've got a, a species like a grizzly that's uh, you know the sl- second slowest reproducing land mammal in the world. I mean, the, the slowest reproducing land mammal in, in North America. It's uh, it's just not uh, something to be playing fast and loose with, saying, you know, if we make a mistake, we'll get it right with the next administration. Um, one, one uh, uh, you know, really bad administration at the state level could essentially send something that we thought was recovered into extinction. Um, and, you know, an animal that at best repro- has a reproductive rate of 2 to 3% per year, that's, that's just foolish to, to, uh, to, match, to match those uh, dynamics up with volatile state politics and, and very slow, very slow, if any, recovery uh, that we see in bears. So, Rick, if, if you were appointed, say, grizzly bears are and had all the authority in the world, um, what would you do to recover grizzly bears? You know, it, it, what's ironic is we're, we, there's nothing new here. We know to, uh, to not kill them. We know they need big, wild country. Uh, the, the, ro- the open road density on public lands in the West is just laughable. Uh, again, it, it's it's um, undignified. It's, it's humiliating to to see government agencies, you know, with Fish and Wildlife Service and Forest Service, with folks who went into the business thinking they were going to help animals, just over time becoming government bureaucrats and, and trying to uh, reduce this this mysterious relationship and and wonderful relationship between wild nature and people to. Um, 
the enumeration of mathematics, uh, saying, okay, well, this one study over in the Flathead shows that uh, bear survival uh, is increased at 59.5% open road density or closed road density. And um, so that's what we're going to do on the Kootenai. That's what we're going to do in Yellowstone. That's the ecosystem. That's what we're going to do here. There's just not enough science for these big decisions to be being made. So uh, I, w I would, you know, continue to advocate bear spray over over pistols. <laughs> I, I would uh, yeah. be more, uh, I would give more power to uh to local managers to, who, who know the site-specific places where bears are to, uh, to protect those with buffer areas uh, from black bear hunters. And, uh, you know, we've got all the pieces. We've got the state is doing a good job of outreach, uh, you know, to beekeepers and chicken farmers and goat farmers and stuff, you know, the three deadly sins in grizzly country. And, and you know, they're trying to electrify, the, you know, the, the shit out of these these really dangerous operations in, in the heart of Grizzly recovery area. But uh, our road closures are ineffective. I would say 60% of the road closures on the Kootenai are not effectively closed. Uh, wow. uh, it's, you know, at least 60. It, it could be, a, it could actually be more than that. It's just really disappointing. Um, you know, we, that would be our first, first step, you know, is to reassess, you know, what, what does a Grizzly core look like? Uh, how big is it and how does it connect to other areas? It's, right now it's just a rotating musical chairs, uh, opening and closing of, of gated roads. It's uh, got to be confusing to that maternal culture. You know, you, you, Even with a 10-year closure, even if it was effectively closed, which it's not, um, uh, uh, you know, the female, say, it, say a 7-year-old female has a 2-year-old has when, when that Kelly hump is, is, is laid in and then, then the you know, she goes off and, and has maybe one more cycle of cubs. Uh, and then in the 10th year, she's got another two-year-old with her, you know, and, and, and they close her, uh, uh, an infant, you know, and, uh, a true cub. And, and she's got to go someplace new and start teaching that, learning that place new and teaching that cub new. You know, 10 years is, is not core habitat. You know, protecting something from from road building for 10 years, that's that's a blink of an eye to a grizzly. Um, that, uh, uh, I think another great area for for improvement is, uh, you know, it's just making our wilderness areas bigger. We don't need to be logging, uh, you know, at the perimeters of these logging areas. We've got God knows more than enough wood uh, down around towns and villages, and, and uh, the market continues to to plummet. Uh, it's logging in in the you know in the Pacific Northwest in northwestern Montana is, is ever more uh, you know sending small diameter wood other places uh, we sure don't need to be spending taxpayer money to be reopening old roads that are grown in uh, much less blading new ones uh, and, and going into the back country where the bears uh, that the bears really rely on to you know in the name of timber uh, there, there's more timber than we can as they say, shake a stick at just right along the open roads. It's falling down. It's uh, got increased mortality from surprise, global warming. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's a long answer to your question, but we know how to do what needs doing. We just need uh, some unification and, and, a re and not to have this schizophrenic response where we start out doing the right thing and then six months later, 18 months later, reverse and do the, the absolute worst thing, which brings me to this goofy-ass Pacific Trail that they're trying to send through the Upper Yak. I mean, it's so schizophrenic. You've got right. Fish and Wildlife Service and Forest Service, um, you know, who up here is no friend of the grizzly bear, I just have to say it, uh, on the Kootenai, um, you know, permitting their their mines in the wilderness and and, uh, and having these ineffective road densities and claiming that the, the yak population of grizzlies is the same as the glacier population of grizzlies so they can do the same thing with trails that Glacier does with trails. It's, it's uh, you know, we've got 20 bears maybe. We might have five breeding age females, if that many. And, and uh, you know, to have Forest Service leadership here on the Kootenai comparing the yak to Glacier as justification for supporting this, this, this goofy Pacific Trail that will, will go through the, the upper heart of the yak is just, uh, again, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's, uh, it's humiliating. It's like we deserve better. We deserve better. If they're going to be bureaucrats and administrators, that's fine, but we deserve better than, better ones than what we've got. Uh, so we're fighting that. I mean, this proposal to send 
4,000 permitted through hikers, uh, you know, on their recreational two-week getaway, the, starting in Glacier and, and driving through like the Golden Spike with their territorial imperative to get <laughs> to the Shining Coast, uh, you know, on the dr- shortest direct red line uh, possible, drawn by bureaucrats in Portland, uh, right through, again, right through the Yak. You've got the schizophrenia of Fish and Wildlife Service and Forest Service saying, okay, we're going to have this. Well, the law has made us have core grizzly habitat dedicated up here in the Upper Yak. Uh, and these 4,000 people per year permitted, plus who knows how many unpermitted with their do- barking dogs and bicycles and so forth, want. they won't affect these bears. Well, they will affect the bears. That's what's called a high-use human recreational trail, and it has legal standing as uh, a corridor that's the same as if you were to drive a, a car or motorcycle down that trail. It, it's going to affect grizzlies, it's going to affect humans, and neither for the positive. The fact that this red line drawn by the bureaucrats who've never been in the yak uh, travels along the Canadian border, you know, where the Border Patrol is trying to stop drug and, and human trafficking from China across the, the border. It's just, yeah. you know, it, it, it's, it, it makes you want to be... Uh, you know, one of those backwoods libertarians who says the government is messed up and we don't need it. Yeah. No, what we don't need is bad government. Uh, We need good government, and we're not getting it up here. It's just a lot of it's intellectual laziness, a lot of it's physical laziness, a lot of it's um, ideological uh, uh, belligerence. You know, there's a culture of that up here in in the Forest Service and in in government. And, uh, you know, it's just people being people, making bad, bad choices. So... Again, we're trying to uh, trying to defend against that, but uh, our, our little group, the Yak Valley Forest Council, really needs help on on these matters. We're trying to hold down and protect these 20 bears. We're trying to hold down and protect this million acres, but some days it's a lot harder than others. Rick, can you expand on that about the your local efforts? Uh, you know, you mentioned how important it is for people to understand the land and what's going on in the land, whether they're managers or residents. And the Act Valley Forest Council has really been a, sort of a beacon of hope for local conservation. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about that work. Yeah, no, it's been a really great um, experience working with them. Uh, we started the group, uh, I guess, you know, all of a sudden it's 20 years ago, uh, back during the timber wars when the perception locally and, and regionally and nationally was that nobody up here on the Kootenai uh, supported wilderness because there was a real... Uh, you know, active element, browbeating and bullying and, and demonizing and polarizing uh, the idea of wilderness. And it's taken us a long time to uh, calm folks down and, re- and remind everyone that, you know, we're all up here because we love this, this wild country. We could, we could live somewhere else. Any, uh, anybody up here in Lincoln County could live somewhere else. And it took a lot of, of, of work and, and um, faith to earn trust, which is not the same thing as earning agreement, you know, and... and, and uh, but we have earned the trust of uh, the bulk of our opposition. You know, we were not out to take away people's guns the way we were accused of doing. We were not out to turn this into a national park, as we're showing with our, our fight against this crazy trail. Uh, we were not out to shut down logging, as we proved by securing the, the region's first stewardship projects, where, where bids were given priority to local loggers. And, and we have found volume for one dying mill after another by, again, uh, focusing on the, um, the small diameter overstock in what's called the urban interface, which admittedly up in, up in this part is not very urban, but, but there is a lot of roaded country with a lot of infill of, of a dog hair lodgepole. Once we lost the, uh, the big plywood mill, which relied on green peelers, once Russia put it out of business by liquidating its old forest up there and selling it um, to the market at $10 a thousand board feet less than what we could do even before the asbestos issues up here. Um, Mm. uh, You know, small wood became more desirable and profitable uh, uh, or usable than it had been in the past. And uh, uh, so we've we've met our our old opponents, uh, you know, where they are. And and to their credit, they have met us where we are. And they, uh, you know, People agree and understand. <laughs> the Forest Service agrees, and under, or the local Forest Service agrees and understands. You know, we have a need for wilderness on the Kootenai. We have a need for wilderness in the Yak. I mean, it's crazy that there's not one acre in in the Yak, million acre landmass north of the Kootenai River, east of Idaho, south of Canada, west of Lake Kukanusa, 
not one acre of designated wilderness in this, this you know, most biologically diverse garden in the state. Uh, but such is the uh, uh, cultural resistance by the local Forest Service. Uh, you know, I hope I live long enough to see us get a great conservation leader on the Kootenai. Uh, you know, that would be, I, I feel like we've paid our dues. We've seen the other kind for a long time, you know, just, just uh, time after time. Yeah, you do seem like you get a lot of retrogrades. Uh, you know, if they're not, if they're not from Idaho, they're from Alaska. You know, and right. that's uh, they're just sent here for one thing, and that's to get the cut out. You know, and they don't realize that groups like the Yak Valley Forest Council, you know, can help them meet their their resource needs. You know, at every level, not just urban interface thinning, but uh, we can help them reduce weeds. We can help them protect grizzly bears, and and, and they come here not, you know. For, they come here believing that those are not their charges also. And, you know, again, maybe it comes from D.C. I don't know. Um, but we're not getting who and what we need, and we haven't for a long time. So, Rick, you started out as a geologist and spent a lot of time as a writer, but you obviously from this conversation you devote – a lot of yourself and your soul to saving these places, and not just locally, but you've been back to D.C. on numerous occasions to meet members of Congress and uh, certainly worked on the national scale. How has that experience of being an advocate affected you, and, and what kind of keeps you going? Um, how has it affected me? It's, uh, you know, it's given me a real respect for history and, and, and the long term. Uh, you know, you you see the stories of other activists who, you know, pursued uh, their their values for for decades, and and uh, uh, you know, it just you just realize that you're a small part in you know a larger you know wonderful pantheon of of uh, people who know what they want and go after it and and try and come up with creative solutions. Uh, you know, just just keep keep going. Uh, I guess that's the second part of your question is how do you keep going? Um, uh, yeah. That's a tough one. Um, I think um, some, you know, on the worst days it's because uh, the only thing, uh, you know, more intolerable than the sustained failure or the inability to get um, get your values met would be to uh, to give up. You know, you just your it, it's at the end of the day uh, your your effort is. Uh, uh, a function of a, a combination, a, a strange equation between your your physical endurance and your uh, your emotional love for for the for the value for the uh, subject for the thing you're fighting for. And so you can have big endurance and little love, or you can have no endurance and big love, or you know, best case, you can have big love and big endurance. But but that's usually when you're young and just starting out. And then you know, <laughs> those other two elements. Well, the, the physical endurance fades, 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 but um, the love grows, grows, grows. So, uh, so you just keep on. You know, it seems like limbo sometimes, but uh, again, um, you know, what alternative is there? What would it feel like to quit? You know, I can imagine what it feels like to curl up and rest, but to, to, to quit, I just can't. That just doesn't seem palatable. Yeah, I struggle with that too. Oh, I know. I know you do. I mean, you you've pushed so hard, so long, and and uh, and, and and seen so many terrible things, and had so many wonderful, uh, you know, short-term victories, and some some real major long-term permanent victories. It's uh, I don't know. I I I'd like to believe that the older I get, uh, and the more I realize times uh, governance in in these matters, uh, the more relaxed I get, and try not to think in terms of burnout, but just show up and do my best each day, and some days my best is real good, and some days my best is going to suck, but as long as I'm just doing the best I can, uh, you know, time is going to sort it out, and uh, doing all you can do, I mean, you really can't ask more for more than that, just do the best you can. So, Rick, at the end of the day, are you an optimist that we can protect wild places like the yak and grizzly bears and wolves? Some days, yeah, not every day, but some days, uh-huh. uh, I mean, some days, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it like this. This this trail, this proposed trail is yeah. like, I mean, if it, it makes you paranoid. It's like, okay, they want to get rid of grizzlies here. You, you, you look at these blog spots where these thru-hikers are 
talking to each other about how once you're out of glacier, there aren't any grizzly bears left, so you can leave your food out in camp. And these, these circulated social media postings about how to bring your dogs illegally onto the trail, even though the trail hadn't even been permitted, even though the Forest Service is already advertising it as if it has. I mean, it's those are tough days. Uh, those are tough days. But, you know, one of the things that helps is having other people on your side and, uh, and being active, uh, you know, instead of just being passive and still and grousing about it. Uh, that's, uh, I think that makes it unbearable. So, you know, being able to do something and, and lobby and work, uh, you know, it's not over yet. So, uh, uh, yeah, there's good days and bad days. So in terms of this Pacific Crest Trail hiker issue, um, you spoke earlier about um, sort of the intergenerational kind of softening of attitudes about nature and wilderness and, and bears, mm-hmm. and yet there, there seems to be also this new generation of recreationists that um, do, or, or, or a little bit like the mentality of some of the old corporations that we used to fight. What do you make of this? Well, um, I mean, it's hard to speak in generalities, or I'm, I'm wary of speaking in generalities because um, uh, you, you can just, uh, you know, some really fine sentiments and fine folks can fall through the cracks when if I were to broad stroke mm-hmm. characterize recreationist, uh, you know, some of the most ethical uh, people I've, I've met are indeed uh, hunters. Some of the most ethical people I've met are indeed, uh, you know, triathletes or, or whatever, or, or, or endurance athletes, you know. So it's mm-hmm. who, who yeah. seek to uh, test their brief uh, youth and strength against the uh, against the mountains and you know and they have a real respect and stewardship for for the thing they love but uh there's the other side of the coin where the mountains are seen as a, a stairmaster and and uh an object you know to be be conquered and and uh and and passed through as quickly as possible without uh you know a, a fully uh sensate engagement and and uh and that's that's toxic. Uh, that's not the spirit of wilderness. Uh, the spirit of wilderness is, is um, you know, a place to meet on its own terms and, and to uh, to have all five of your senses, all six of your senses engaged at more at a pace that, uh, you know, that's more uh, in tune with everything else in there. Uh, it's not a raceway, and uh, and it's not a linear highway, you know, with with markers along the way uh, mm-hmm. uh it's not how far you go into the wilderness uh that matters or how fast you go through it but uh or even that you go into it at all it's it's uh it's it's a lot more complicated than that and it's it's the last thing it should be viewed as in my opinion as a commodity of what does it have to give us i mean it's easy to think that way what does the wilderness have to give us because it has given us so much as you know Wallace Stegner and so many others have have pointed out but uh, you know, it would be nice to turn the corner as a as a culture. You know, and after 200 plus years, it, it, I think we might be a little overdue in this country. And think about what uh, you know, what is our obligation and responsibility? To, what can we give back to wilderness in, in exchange for what it's given us, instead of just this uh, this 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 grocery store shopping shelf uh, expedition mentality of. Uh, bucket listing and, and and top ten place listing and just take, take, take. Uh I know I sound like an old person and I and I am, but uh are getting that way, but uh uh yeah it's it's in general it's a problem. Well I appreciate um all that you shared today and indeed share your hope that we do in turn this culture and find a way in ourselves to give back to wild places that have given us so much. Well, thanks. We've sure got some bright spots, like uh, your and Dave's work for bears and wolves, and and uh, and the whole state, the whole West, and uh, you know, and we've we've got a handful of allies in Congress, and, and uh, um, it's not over yet. Uh, you know, we've got a few allies in Helena. It's not over yet. It's uh, absolutely. We just have to keep showing up and working harder. Yeah. Well, thank you, Rick. Thank you. You're listening to the Grizzly Times, and we're here today with author and advocate Rick Bass. Thanks so much, Rick. 
Well, thank you, Louise. I sure appreciate it.